Welcome to the beginning of chapter four. Chapter four, as we can see on the slide here, is all about probability. So probability is a pretty big concept. It is not a concept that is just for statistics. It's for all kinds of different uh, fields. Um, but the work we're going to do after chapter four in statistics relies heavily on the ideas of probability, on the concept of probability. And so in this fourth chapter, there are four sections. And this chapter is devoted to trying to introduce and help students understand the ideas of probability so that the statistics work that we do after that can be understood better and more fully. However, we won't really see much statistics specifically in chapter four at all no samples and population studies and things like that, just the pure conceptual idea of probability and examples that relate to it. Also, uh, as a reminder, chapter four is the last chapter we're going to go over that is covered uh, on our first midterm, which is on chapters one through four. So when we do get to the end of chapter four, uh, we will start going into chapter five, but we'll also start thinking about preparing for the midterm, the first midterm. So what do we have in chapter four in a little more detail? Four sections, actually five, but we are skipping the fifth section, the probabilities through simulations, which is a website topic, as you can see. Um, we never planned to cover that optional section. So all of the homework assignments and the midterm and everything will just be based on the four sections of chapter four, um, skipping the fifth one. And so the first of those begins with basic concepts of probability, just the basic idea and the basic, basic way that we begin to think about how to create a mathematical model to understand and calculate probability values. And then we will have three other sections. 4-2, addition rule multiplication, 4-3, four, 4-4. Four, four. I want to point out that the first homework assignment on chapter four is just on the first three sections. And then that dreadful fourth section, which for some students will honestly be the hardest section for the whole semester, not for everyone, but for some students, it's definitely challenging. It has assignments all to itself, just um, the one section. It's the only homework we have that only covers one section. Um, and that'll be due the week after the first chapter four uh, assignments are due that are on the first three sections. So that's what we have in front of us. And we're gonna start today with the basic concepts of probability. Key concept, the single most important objective of this section is to learn how to interpret probability values. So values, we're gonna think of probability as a number, as a value, and then we wanna be able to interpret what that value means in some situation where it applies. So these values are expressed as values between zero and one and never anything else. So it never, we'll, we'll never say the probability is two. The probability will always be between a number between zero and one. So that means you can often think of it as a decimal that starts with a zero. 0 0.3, 0 0.5. And because the, prob the numbers in those decimal ranges are often easily thought of as percentages, probabilities are often used with percentage measurement as well. So for example, if you have a probability of 0.5, that you could also say that's a 50% probability. Um, so a small probability it's, uh, such as 0 0.001 corresponds to an event that rarely occurs. So the probability is referring to the likelihood that an event will occur. And the closer the number is to zero, the lower the chance that that will happen. And the closer the number is to one, the greater the chance that that will happen. And using percentages, because sometimes that feels more comfortable, if I say there's a 1% chance or one out of 100 chance that something will happen, as you can imagine, that feels very low. And if I can say there's a 99% chance that'll happen, that's almost a certainty. The certainty is 100%. It's 100% gonna happen. That means it will happen guaranteed. 0%, that means there's no chance it can occur. 
And the range goes from 0% up to 100%, which as a value is a number from 0 to 1. So next are odds, and we won't spend as much time talking about odds, but they are introduced here and how they relate to probabilities. It's basically a different way to express probabilities, so that's discussed in the section as well. They're commonly used in situations such as lotteries and gambling. They'll say, yeah, the odds of the horse winning the race are one to, one to seven or five to two or whatever. All right, so these are the key concepts that are gonna be introduced in this first section of chapter four on probabilities. So some of the basics of probabilities to give us a way to talk about them and to quantify them, meaning to enumerate or make calculations to give um, values for probabilities in certain situations. First is an event is any collection of results or outcomes of a procedure. So when they say these things general like this, it's very hard to understand what they're talking about. So let me give specific examples right off the bat. And probably the simplest one to start with is imagine that you are flipping a coin and you can talk about the probability of getting heads or tails. And if you flip it several times, you could say, well, I flipped it three times what's the chance or the probability that they all come out to be heads for all three tries. That's the kind of procedure or an event that you wanna think of. So let's just keep it at its simplest level. Let's say my procedure is I flip a coin and the event is the collection of results that happen when I flip a coin and observe which side landed up. And so there are two possible outcomes or events um, or there's two outcomes in the event of flipping the coin and seeing what you get. One is that you got heads and one is that you got tails. Those are two different outcomes. And then I could make a probability statement like if I flip the coin, then there's a 50% probability that it gives me heads. So that's involving an event, a procedure, so now a little harder to understand is a simple event is an outcome or an event that cannot be further broken down into simpler components. So to understand that at all, we have to know what it means to break events down into simpler components. And so we'll let examples illustrate that for us. And a sample space for a procedure like flipping a coin consists of all possible simple events. And again, they're using simple event here, but let's stick to the coin toss. So a sample space for a procedure might be heads or tails, because those are possible events that can result when I flip the coin. And they're as simple as it can get. You either get heads, you get tails, you can't make it any simpler than that. So that's called a sample space. You could designate it with like an T for tails and an H for heads. And then you could literally list the sample space as the set containing the results T comma H. We'll see all of this in action shortly. So that is the sample space consists of all outcomes that cannot be broken down any further. Like I either got heads or tails, that's it. All right, so let's uh, move into some examples because you really need examples to start to wrap your mind around this terminology. So here we have an example and it says in the following display, we're using a B to denote a baby boy and a G to denote a baby girl. And we have a couple different possible procedures to consider. The first procedure is that there's a single birth. So that's a procedure, uh, an event that leads to an outcome like flipping a coin, or in this case, having a baby. And the type of event that we're gonna consider is simply the gender of the child born. And it says an example of an event, I had one girl. That's a simple event because can't make it any, can't break that down into simpler possibilities. And the sample space would be the collection of all the possible results, which were namely B or G for boy or girl described in a set. 
So now in order to illustrate sort of the difference between simple events and just regular events, they consider the procedure instead of having three births. And so an example of an event was that when you had your three kids, you had two boys and a girl. That is an event. The event was I had two boys and a girl when I had my three kids. But there's different ways that that could have occurred. And as they illustrate here, you could have had two boys and a girl, or you could have had a boy, then a girl, then a boy, or you could have had a girl first and then two boys. Those are all ways that you could have had the event occur of having two boys and one girl as your total tally in the end. But because the event of two boys and a girl can be broken into those three possible simpler events that cannot be broken into anything simpler, just tell me each boy or each child born, was it a boy or a girl, then we'll figure out whether it was two boys and a girl in the end. Then that's an event broken into simple events. So two boys and a girl could be broken into those three possible simple events that would result in you ending up with two boys and a girl. I know this is challenging. It's definitely hard to understand. And we'll pause for conversation in a second to see if we can help talk through this. But what would be the sample space? So as it defined in the earlier slide, to create a sample space, you need to list all the possible events that are simple, all the possible outcomes in the simplest way to break them down. And so when they are showing in the case of the three births, an event could be two boys and a girl, but since that's not a simple event, the sample space won't specifically have two boys and a girl listed. It'll have every simple way that you could have had three births occur. Boy, 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 girl, boy, girl, boy. And as you, if you count these up, you'll see there are eight different possible ways that you could have had the three births in terms of what genders you had and when. Then in this collection, in this sample space of all possible results for three kids, you could identify the three simple events that together form the result that you had two boys and one girl. All right, so let's pause here because a lot just came out. It's kind of overwhelming. And is anybody willing to ask a question for clarity? discuss this at all, have a conversation. Anything we can do to talk about this to help understand it better or explore it more? So I just for like clarification, so the simple event would be like having two girls and a boy, but the sample uh, space would be all the different outcomes that could have produced two boys or two girls and a boy. The sample space is all possible outcomes, period. Not just of an event that's being considered. It's all possible outcomes. And then some of those simple events in all possible simple events, when considered together, might be classified as having had two boys and a girl. All right, great. So for example, if you look on the ones on the right, only the three that they listed as simple events under two boys and a girl, boy, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, and girl, boy, boy, only those three ends you up, ends up giving you two boys and a girl. But there's eight of them over here. So that means in three of the eight ways that you can have three births in their genders, you end up with two boys and a girl. And in the other five possible ways that you can have gendered births, you don't have two boys and a girl, you have some other combination. Is that better? Oh, makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. Other questions, comments, discussions about this idea of how to model an event and a procedure? All right, so let, I'm just going to get ahead of the game a little bit to sort of explain why they're doing all this in relation to probability. Because the basic idea of these simple events is that when you break things down in the simplest event possible, then those are going to be hopefully equally likely. 
And if you have a case here where there's eight different possible outcomes when you have three births and you consider the genders, then that means there's eight different possible combinations of how you could have had boys and girls that are all equally likely. And then if you consider an event like, well, I had two boys and a girl, you can then determine the probability of that event occurring by making the portion of ways that that result could have happened out of all the different possible results that could have happened. And I'm gonna introduce that now because if you're imagining this as at the core of a probability statement, then all of this work we're doing to set up this sample spaces and events will there'll be a reason for doing that that hopefully makes sense as you're developing comfort with it. So for example, in this case, I could state that if you took a look here, there's three simple events that will result in having a boy and two boys and a girl. And there are eight simple events altogether that could have occurred. So the probability when you have three kids of ending up with two boys and a girl is three out of the eight possibilities or three eighths. And that's a number between zero and one. You can convert that into a decimal or a percentage. It would be about a 38% chance, 37.5%. So that means if anyone's gonna have three kids, there's a 37.5% chance that they're gonna end up with two boys and a girl. Now that's very simplistic and there's some genetics involved and things like that. But if you just thought that in each case, a boy or a girl is equally likely 50, 50 chance, then the likelihood of having three kids and ending up with two boys and a girl is 37.5%. And that's a probability statement. And we can do a calculation by making a, a portion of how many ways the event could occur out of all the different ways that things could occur. And that fraction is a way to calculate a probability. This will all be defined in the coming slides, but in this simple example, we can begin thinking about it right away. Questions, comments, discussion? Okay, I have a question. If you give three births as prescribed here and mapped out here, what is the probability of having only boys? One out of eight. Exactly. And the probability of having three girls? One out of eight again. Exactly. And so I think this, gives you a chance to imagine when you have this kind of work done and laid things out, then you can calculate the likelihood of different possible results occurring in the future. All right, let's move on. That's one of five, but I think they're gonna do some of this work. So now they're going to apply those definitions to what they just showed you there. Simple events with one birth, the result of one girl is a simple event and the result of one boy is another simple event. They are individual simple events because they cannot be broken down any further. Simple events in sample spaces with three births, the result of two girls followed by a boy is a simple event, very specific. It can't be any simpler than what did I have on the first, second and third kid. So that's an event, example of a simple event. Notice that that's not the only way to have two girls and a boy, but if you have two girls followed by a boy, there's only one way that can happen. That's as simple as it gets. Now they also bring in the idea of rolling a die. So this is a good second example. When rolling a die, the outcome of a five is a simple event. The outcome of an even number is not a simple event because it can be broken in down into simple, more primary events where an even number would mean that you got either a two or a four or a six. And there's three, those three simple events as a collection would mean that in the end you got an even number. Questions, comments, discussions?
All right, so here's my follow-up question. What, if I roll a die, what is the probability of getting a five? One out of six. Perfect. What is the probability of getting an even number? Three of six. So if it's and you can simplify three over six. One half. So one half because it's going to be either even or odd and there's the same number of each type. So that's a 50-50 chance. So you can make the fraction to determine a probability and then if you simplify that fraction, it helps simplify the concept as well. Questions about that? Comments? Discussion? All right, so let me go beyond this then and talk about the idea of probability a little more because we have to begin this sense of what probability is talking about as well. So let me give you, a, 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 I'm gonna go on a tangent here away from our slides. We're not gonna get through all 40, not close, but we can still do a good introduction today. Let's say I said, that the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow is 20%. You've probably heard statements like that on weather reports and things like that. Likelihood of precipitation tomorrow, 20%. So here's something I'd like you to think about. What does that mean? I think it's a comment that we're used to hearing the pretty pretty comfortable. You may even have a sense of what to do with that information, like whether you want to prepare for rain or not, or, but what does that mean? It's unlikely that there's going to be rain. Like it's not impossible, but it's not very likely. Uh, definitely. I think that's a good classification of the 20% level, but can we be more specific about what the 20 means? Like, for example, you could say the exact same thing about 15%, 25%, 22%. So somehow those should have different meanings and there should be some sense of how that level of detail, at least theoretically with like the work we've been just showing, could be arrived at. What does that mean? So it's something to wrap your minds around. So here's, here's where I'm gonna keep things moving and, and you may already have a pretty good sense of it. But the thing to point out about probability is that it's a prediction about the future. When you say there's a particular likelihood that something will occur, well, we have to be comfortable with what that means because it's either gonna happen or it's not, right? So for example, if I'm talking about the weather tomorrow, it's either gonna rain or it's not gonna rain. So if we get a little confused, we might say, well, that either happens or it doesn't. There's two possible outcomes. So that means 50-50 chance is gonna rain. But we know that's not right. But there are only those two outcomes. The thing is that they're not simple whether something's gonna rain or not and sort of the different ways that it could end up raining is not simple at all. Now we looked at the different ways to have two boys and a girl and there was different ways you could do that. There was three different ways you could do that. Well, imagine all the different ways it could end up raining. All the clouds go this way and they collect moisture and then they come over here or they go a different way. It's super complicated. You cannot break a chaotic system like weather into simple events. And what that means is that when you have an event like it rains, it will never be simple. And they have to use some sort of models and things like that. So we're looking at simple events and sample spaces. Those are gonna be in very controlled situations. And then we can talk about a probability of something happened, but we also use probabilities in situations that are not very controlled. And so how do the two, how are the two things talking about the same thing? So here's the way I'm gonna recommend you think about it, is that when you are using a probability to talk about something that is going to occur, some event, some procedure is gonna happen and an event will occur. There's gonna be some weather and it rains or it doesn't. 
when you give a percentage as a probability, just for simple sake, 20%, that means 20 out of 100. And so the way you can think of it is that if you, if you repeated the procedure that's gonna lead to the event, in terms of weather, it would mean if you went into days like the day tomorrow with the circumstances that we see now, with conditions as they are now, if we went into days like tomorrow a hundred times with the same conditions that we're observing now, of those hundred days that were just like the conditions now, 20 out of those hundred days it would rain. And the other 80 days it would not. So a probability is trying to make a prediction about the future, but it's basically saying, even if this only happens once, if it was allowed to repeat a hundred times, this many of them would turn out with the event that we're predicting. 20 out of those hundred times, it would be rain. And so that allows us to think about probabilities historically. Like maybe the way that they make a prediction about whether it'll rain tomorrow is they look at all of the history that they have on record of when conditions were like they are now, the barometer, the temperature, those kinds of things. And then they say, well, out of the last hundred days that were like today is, the next day it rained. 20 of those hundred days. Out of those hundred days, the next day that it rained, 20 days were like that. So we think that going into tomorrow, historically, 20% of the time it's rained. So we'll say that tomorrow there's a 20% chance that it will rain. So that's, that's the way you can think of it. You can think of it like that. And sometimes you don't have history to, ba to base your decision on. Sometimes you have to use some theory, but the idea is, is in situations like this, when we do this procedure, if we did it a hundred times, 20 of those times we would get rain and the other 80 we wouldn't. So we say 20% chance of rain. Questions, comments, discussions about that? All right, so one more example, because we wanna be thinking about this through all of these words that they give us and all of these examples that they give us. Let's say you're going uh, to play cards and there's this game called blackjack where you're dealt two cards and if you get basically a 10 and an ace, that's called blackjack and that's a good thing. So someone can say, well, what's the probability that you're just immediately dealt blackjack? Well, the way you would figure that out is you would look at all the different possible ways you could be dealt two cards. Those would be the simple events of all the different possible two card results. And then you would say, well, how many of those would be designated as a blackjack? Then the portion of blackjack hands of two cards out of all the two card hands is the percent chance that you get a blackjack. And that's then predicting that in the future, if you keep dealing two card hands from a fresh deck, that in the general, if you do that a hundred times, then there's some percentage of those, eight out of a hundred or however many it is, in which you get a blackjack. And you can therefore make that prediction because the next hundred, hundred hands all sort of randomly going to occur, there's the chance that out of those hundred, you're probably gonna get about seven or eight of those or whatever the percentage is, I don't know the percentage is. So then you could use the theory of creating a sample space of hands and making a fraction to then make a prediction about a future and the next hundred times that you deal two cards and how many of those will most likely be a blackjack. Questions, comments, discussions about that? All right, let's move on. Lots of things to think about with probability. So they're further looking at this example of having the kids. It's not a simple event to have three births where you get two boys and a girl because there's different ways than that can occur. So that event can be broken into simpler events, three different simpler events. And then they look back over at this table to explain how they got the sample space. So three common approaches to finding the probability of an event. So to look at these three ways to do it, first we're going to introduce some notation. 
we're going to use a big P that is capital and italic to denote a probability. A, B, and C with capital letters denote specific events like the big A there could be the event that you had two boys and a girl or that you flipped a coin and it came up heads. And then if you put kind of in what you may remember from algebra as function notation, if you put the P followed in parentheses by one of the event letters, then that is the probability of that particular event occurring. So this is just ways so that we can write notation and talk about these ideas. And there's six slides to look at these ideas for finding probability. Possible values of probabilities and the more familiar and common expressions of likelihood, which we've already begun to use. So I used the coin toss as our first example because that puts us right away at the 50-50 chance. And that's a very common discussion to have when talking about something. What's the chance going to rain tomorrow? 50-50. 50-50 chance it's going to rain. And then as you leave that and something becomes more likely to occur and moves more like being a certainty, as I discussed before, a probability of one means that it's 100%. It's a certainty that it's going to occur. Well, maybe I'm a little less, like 90%. Well, then that would be something that's likely. Where exactly? They're not going to try to define that. Normally, something that is equally likely to happen or not happen, we don't want to say is likely, unless it's something you're really scared about. Then maybe you even would. Like um, if a plane was going to crash 50% of the time, and someone said, well, what's the chance the plane's going to crash if I go on it? And somebody says 50-50. Well, then you would say, well, that's too likely for me because 50% likely to go down in a plane crash, that seems really likely for something that I want to really be almost close to impossible or to be very, very, very unlikely. So there's some judgment calls in the use of the word likely and unlikely. But as you can see on the scale here, we like to think of things being likely when there's a very strong chance that they will occur and things being unlikely when there's a lower probability that they will occur. So now they're going to get to these three approaches to calculating a probability. The following three approaches for finding probabilities result in values between 0 and 1. So the probability of an event will between, be between 0 and 1. I think that's what that's supposed to say. I think there's supposed to be some. One sec, drop my pen. I think there's supposed to be. Uh, less than or equal to in here and here. I will try to fix slides when I see mistake or omissions. So that means when you calculate P of A, a probability of event A, that's going to be a number that will be somewhere between zero and one inclusive. Okay, method number one, the first one we looked at. Relative frequency, approximation of a probability, conduct or observe a procedure and count the number of times that event A occurs, and then approximate as follows. The probability that event A will occur is the number of times that it happened in your procedure or your experiment divided by the number of times the procedure was repeated. So this is and observe as a way to calculate probabilities by observation. So I alluded to this when I said one of the ways you could calculate the chance of it raining tomorrow would be to look historically at the last 100 days where you went into the day with conditions that match the way they are now, and then look in of those 100, how many of them did it rain the next day, and then approximate the probability that it will rain tomorrow by the number of times that it rained in days in the, in the past like this, divided by the 100 days that we looked at. So this is through observations. For example, if I wanted to determine the probability of getting heads for a coin, I could say, well, that's one out of two equally likely possibilities. So that's one out of two, which is 50%. But what if somebody has one of those coins that's been rigged or loaded or weighted, where they put a weight somehow on one side to make it more likely to land down on that side and have the other side face up? 
So that could be kind of a trick coin where it's much, much easier to get heads than tails. Well, how would I then see what the probability of getting heads would be? Well, I could just try to flip it 100 times or 1,000 times and count out how many times it came out to be heads. So maybe by applying some weighted paint, for example, to the tail side so it lands on the tail side down more often, maybe when I flip it 100 times, instead now I get 75 heads and 25 tails. So I've increased the chance of it getting heads to being instead of 50-50, 75% likely to get heads because I weighted the coin as an example. So you could try to determine a probability by repeating a procedure and counting the portion of the times that happened with event A as a result. Questions, comments, discussions about that? Um, isn't that also the same as basically, so for the sake of the coin flipping, couldn't you also multiply like 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5? like 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 if you so were to- I think the procedure you're talking about is not the likelihood of getting heads when I flip it once, but getting heads when I flip it multiple times and getting heads every time, mm -hmm. which is something that I think is in a later section. Okay. And, and so that, that's good. That means you've had some probability exposure and you're trying to make sense of these things that you saw done. And you're trying to say, is that what they're talking about in this case? That's great. So if I just have a coin and I don't think it's 50-50 that I'm gonna get heads when I flip it once because the coin's been altered. Well, then I'm not gonna use the 50% measurement and multiply it by itself a bunch of times. I'm not gonna use it at all because that's not the chance I get heads on that coin. Okay. Instead, what I can say is I could just flip it a thousand times and see how many times it came up heads. And if three quarters of those times were heads, then I would say, well, then when I flip this coin once, my probability of heads is three quarters or, or 75%. Is that making sense? Yeah. Let's, so that's number one. Number two, this is the classical approach. This is like math formulas, math calculations. The classical approach to probability requires equally likely outcomes. So that's what I was discussing before. If I say it's gonna rain or it's not gonna rain tomorrow, those are events, but they're not simple nor equally likely. And that means they don't need to be 50-50 chance. Equally likely means all has the same likelihood of occurring. So in the case of having a boy or a girl, there's a simplified sense that that's a 50-50 result. And therefore, if we look at boy, girl for all three kids being born, every one of those possibilities was equally likely to happen. And so a classical approach to probability requires equally likely outcomes in the simple events in the sample space. And I'm already using vocabulary that we introduced, so I know it's easy for these sentences to lose you. But if you think of the eight possible ways the gender could come out with the three kids, the key to making the fraction give us the probability is that those eight, eight results were all equally likely to occur. And if three of them are two boys and a girl, then I can say three out of eight is the chance of having two boys and a girl. So to have that kind of a calculation do, we make a fraction. The probability will be the number of ways that A, the event can occur, divided by the number of ways that anything could have occurred, S divided by N. And in the case of the kids with having three of them and getting two boys and a girl, there was three ways you could get two boys and a girl and eight ways that any of the three kids could have genders born. And that produced a three-eighths probability. So this is the classical approach, this fraction. How many ways can I get a blackjack? How many ways can I get any two cards? Make the fraction. That's the probability of getting a blackjack. Questions, comments, discussion? So that's method number two. So then they're gonna give you this broad general thing, which is not very mathematical, but can be logical, which we won't really use to do any problems because it's very imprecise. 
subjective probabilities. The probability of an event A is estimated by using knowledge of the relevant circumstances. So basically, you're going to say by understanding circumstances, you can make a prediction in the future, even though you have no history to base it on and you have no mathematical model of equally likely outcomes. So you could just kind of look around and look at, well, there's no clouds in the sky. I'm up on the top of this hill. I don't see any storm clouds for as far as I can see. So I think the chance that it's going to rain tonight is going to be very, very low. And I could even try to guess it and say 5%, 2%. Well, I'm, I'm not using a mathematical model. I'm not looking at historical days like this. I'm just using my sense of what conditions need to be in place to cause rain and some sense of not being able to see any of that going on. Maybe also involves time of the year, who knows. But nonetheless, it can be done. And a lot of times it can be done well enough to satisfy probability statements and people's need to feel that there's a likelihood or not likelihood of something happening. So it's really the first two. And the first one is looking at history or looking at results from the past. So all of the math formulas and calculations, they come into play for method number two, where you use theory and you make a fraction. And that's what we're going to be doing in 4.4, which will be challenging. The last thing they're going to mention is simulations. That's what they do in 4.5 that we are not going to do. Fancy computers can try to take dynamics and complicated situations and set up models and make predictions based on that called simulations. And that's going to be the section we're skipping, so you don't have to worry about that. When expressing the value of probability, either give the exact fraction or decimal or round off final decimal results to three significant digits. This is just a good practice. You will have some problems that want you to give the fractional value to be exact and not round off. 10 minutes left. And we are not quite halfway through the slides. So there's a lot to learn here. I'm going to take the last five minutes and jump over to the homework and see what some of these early chapter four assignment probability problems on the homework look like to see if you feel that these discussions and what we're going over put you in a position to start trying to do some of that. But they're going to go over several things here and let's take a look at a few more minutes worth. The law of large numbers. As a procedure is repeated again and again, the relative frequency probability of an event tends to approach the actual probability. So what does that mean with a simple example? If I flip a coin a large number of times and I look at the frequency of how many of those times I got heads. Well, as I do that more and more times, I would expect that the portion of times that I got heads will tend to approach 50% because that's the actual probability with a fair coin of getting heads. Now, take, think about this. There's a 50% chance of getting heads, but if you flip it once, you either got the heads, which means you got heads 100% of the time, or you got tails, which means you got heads 0% of the time. The only two frequencies when you flip it once are nowhere near 50%, <laughs> and you can't get a 50%. So you often need an, a, a procedure to happen a lot of times to have the actual numbers through random chance settle in to the actual probability and that's what they will do. When you go to a casino and you gamble on getting a blackjack, well, you could get lucky and make a bunch of money. And you could get lucky or very unlucky and not win any of your bets and lose all your money immediately even though you'd think you would normally have gotten blackjack some of the time. Well, the casino does not rely. They make their bet odds based on the theoretical or actual probability of getting blackjack. They don't rely on luck. Why? Because they've got blackjack being played thousands and thousands of times every day. And so with the large number of odds, they're very safely betting that the actual probabilities will be how many times people get blackjack and that when that happens that amount of times, they make money. So they rely heavily on the law of large numbers and what they've shown over time is that it's incredibly accurate for predictions. 
But if you know the actual probability of something happening and you run it a bunch of times, in the long run, that's the percentage of the time it will happen. And so the cautions to think about for this concept is the law of large numbers applies to behavior over a large number of trials and does not apply to any one individual outcome. If I flip a coin once, I can't get heads 50% of the time. I only flipped it once. If we know nothing about the likelihood of a different possible outcomes, we should not assume that they are equally likely. Well, it's going to rain or not. Equally likely? No, not equally likely. And if you don't know that they're equally likely, don't assume they are. The actual probability depends on factors such as the amount of preparation and the difficulty of the test, et cetera. All right, let's see what's number 20. And then they have an example of relative frequency in the next couple of slides at the halfway point of our slideshow. So I'm gonna stop there and let you guys check out that example on your own. There are only a few minutes left and I do wanna see what questions look like based on all of this discussion and information that they've provided. So stop this. And let's just jump right over to the homework for a quick look. So homework number four, again, not due till the following Sunday, but no time like the present if you can look on it. Let's just go to number five, see what we get. So here it gives us a list of numbers and says which of the following values cannot be probabilities. And they have them all listed and we're supposed to select the ones that cannot be probabilities. So how would we look at these and know which of these cannot be probabilities? Suggestions? Well, the first thing we talked about with probabilities is that it's a number and it has to be between zero and one. So any of these numbers that are not between zero and one inclusively cannot be probabilities. It's as simple as that. So square root of two is bigger than one. Negative something is below zero. That's bigger than one. Three fifths, that's less than one, but five thirds is bigger than one. Does that make sense? So we do have questions here, basically just trying to see if the stuff they talked about made sense to you in these discussions. Then they're gonna have a judgment call uh, where you determine whether you think something is significantly high or low. If I have 300 kids and seven of them are girls, do we think that that's a very low number for girls, a high number for girls, not that significantly high or low? Any opinions? Significantly low. Yeah, we'd think that about half of them, because that's large scale of large numbers and girls should be about 50%. So I'd be thinking I'm in the ballpark of 150. And so I'd think that number of girls is significantly low, like something's wrong. See if we can look at one more here. For a certain racehorse, the odds in favor, okay, so this is an odds description, which we didn't get to in the slides. So I'll skip that and leave that to you because we didn't get to introduce that today. In a certain study, a chance of encountering a car crash on the road is stated as 21%. Express the indicated degree of likelihood as a probability between zero and one inclusive. So if they say the probability is 21%, how would we express that as a number between zero and one? 0 0.21. I'm liking it. My homework's on the line. I'm trusting you. Nice. All right. So hopefully you can see when you're reading through this material, you want to try to make sense of it. It's a lot to understand, but that the problems are really trying to see if that's what you did successfully or not. And again, you have plenty of time to get this finished successfully, but I think once you've exposed yourself to the material, 